welcome everyone. Um, we are um, gathered here today to have a very exciting webinar on community engaged health uh, and unachievable utopia or possible. So this is a, 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 an issue that is quite dear to the heart of the Brain and Mind Institute. Uh, for those that are not aware, the Brain and Mind Institute is a fairly young institute established at the Akan University uh, with the mandate to address issues of mental health and neuroscience. And it works on four platforms, education, uh, research, innovation or translation of research and partnerships. So uh, the Brain and Mind Institute's ethos is essentially from the neuron to the neighborhood. Uh, we're very much focused on focusing on the community uh, and the needs of the communities that we serve. And so, um, as I often say, Brain and Mind is a big tent where researchers, clinicians, uh, community members, and uh, other stakeholders can come together uh, for important discussions, and this being one of them today. Um, we have participants. Welcome, everybody. We have people from Kenya, from Pakistan, from the US, from the United Kingdom, from Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, Malawi. So it's, it's so nice to see uh, participants from so many different countries that come to join us on our important discussions. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Oliver Ensek, my colleague, who will now introduce the keynote speaker. So Olivera, over to you. Thank you, Zul. Uh, it's my great pleasure and privilege to, to introduce our today's guest speaker, Dr. David Buck. Dr. Buck is a family physician. He's a medical educator, a mentor, and notable researcher in the field of social determinants of health. And most of all, He's a relentless advocate for providing healthcare to the underserved and a true champion of new models of care. He's currently uh, an associate dean for community health at the University of Houston College of Medicine in Houston, where he's also a professor in the Department of Clinical Sciences, Department of Behavioral Health and Social Sciences, and in the Department of Population Health and Health System Sciences. Before coming to the University of Houston College of Medicine, Dr. Buck was at the renowned Baylor College of Medicine for 21 years, where he rose through the ranks to become a full professor in 2011. It would take too long to list all his accomplishments as an academic physician, including dozens of research grants, bringing in more than $25 million, his research articles, book chapters, and more than 20 awards. Let me mention just a few awards that encapsulate the extraordinary contributions Dr. Buck has made to medicine. He received, for example, Compassion in Medicine Award, Leadership Luminary in Public Health, Public Health Leader National Award, Champion of Health Award, and the Albert Schweitzer Servant Leader Award. Therefore, it's not surprising that his selfless dedication to the public health and to the health of underserved populations began even before he entered medical school, when he worked with Mother Teresa in Calcutta in 1984. Before I hand the virtual podium over to Dr. Buck, I would like to say that Dave is the physician we all can only hope to find when we go to the clinic. He is compassionate and caring, and sincerely dedicated to health equity and values-based care. Dr. Bach, the podium is yours. Well, thanks so much for that very generous um, introduction. Uh, now I have to try to live up to it, which uh, I, I don't know if it's possible. So thank you for seeing such uh, generosity in, in my 
uh, work. So I'm thrilled to be here and for this honor of the invitation to, to be with you all who I see as kindred spirits. And I love the neuron to the neighborhood. Never even have heard anything like that. And uh, so I am grateful to be a part of this conversation. Um, my biases come in part from my privilege of working with the homeless that Dr. Nessick Taylor shared and uh, the, the, the privilege of working with people uh, living on the margins. Their gentle and generous guidance have taught me much about how our approach and systems of care fail them. And they are the ones who, who need it most. Homelessness is a brutal prism, refracting catastrophic failure at many social uh, levels education, employment, housing, transportation, and health, to name a few. So to share with you what the talk will be on is first, what's the, the context of social risk factors, social determinants, Houston, US, and global? And what is health equity and social determinants of health? And how does data really have much to do with it? And how can we reduce bias? What are some alternatives to siloed data and siloed care? And how uh, some examples of how we can identify new ways of providing care. And if we really want health equity, we must look at new pathways, focus on partnership, which is what um, you all alluded to at the beginning of this presentation, sharing power, which is uh, a rather radical uh, notion in that the biomedical model has always had a fairly rigid doctor-patient relationship. What are some uh, opportunities such as values-based care and what co-creation, how that takes place on an individual and a uh, um, collective level. We're designed to think categorically in binary. And I think nobody would know this uh, better than the Brain Mind Institute, that we see things as threat or no threat, true or false. Are, are we equal? Well, are men and women equal? Um, I would say, no, the issue isn't equality or inequality or justice or equity. The issue is the context. What is needed in this context? What is needed in each setting? And that varies. The, the, the real question is, how can we have equal access to resources? And that's our aspiration. So what are the social determinants of health? And um, why is it, what are the, what's the context for social determinants of health? Well, where should we, where should we focus? It's often overwhelming. The clinical care only, only uh, accounts for 20% of the impact on health. Yet in the US, we spend more than 90% in clinical care. So, Let's return to the prism, this idea of what homelessness, as well as many uh, social risk factors uh, result in these catastrophic failures in, in our education system through illiteracy, uh, through unemployment in, in uh, employment or lack of employment systems in training, in our criminal justice systems, through punishment and rehab philosophies. We don't rehab, we punish. Food and, and nutritional insecurity, uh, as well as uh, unrecognized trauma and really no adequate ways for treatment. And then last but most importantly, behavioral health. What, how can we uh, increase the resources so that we can address the behavioral health needs that usually emerge from challenges with education and uh, in uh, early development. 
So a very short video. What are the social determinants of mental health? We can't really separate the social determinants of mental health from the social determinants of health. We are all affected by the social determinants. The big differential is where we are on a social gradient. If you're not in poverty, you've got good education, you live in a nice area, exactly as Ruth was saying, you can push the stone relatively easily. If you're living in poverty, you've got limited access to education, you're living in very challenging housing conditions, that stone is almost crushing you. Lots of people had tried to understand what is it that leads to inequities, what is it that leads to disparities, but actually the social determinants of health and the social determinants of mental health are most responsible. The only way me and Sandy were able to connect was in that space of empathy, right? Because you have to understand when somebody coming from the community and we blend with the world of academia, that is a healing space for both sides of the aisle. Okay, so moving from these collective social determinants uh, referred to as a social gradient, we can look at what makes it so difficult. Uh, what makes these uh, competing priorities, these layered social determinants have a collective impact? Well, we can return uh, to the behavioral economics literature and look at how these competing priorities compete for our, our uh, cognitive time through tunneling, where we have less flexible intelligence. So the very people that have the most stress are inherently uh, with less capacity to process new information. There was a, uh, uh, a horrible oil spill in uh, uh, it's kind of the Alaskan coast with called the Exxon Valdez. And you can look at a very bright guy who was sleep deprived. Um, that was a part of what contributed to his um, uh, fateful night where they had a, a bad oil spill. The IQ points from India and New Jersey studies show at least 14 IQ points when we try to look at uh, these competing priorities. So the homeless, which to me embody uh, people that are struggling the most with many different levels of poverty are the least fit to try to cope with it. So tunneling is a factor. Well, what are the best practices? What could we do differently? Why is it that we give the people least able uh, to cope with these competing priorities onto them. We don't have coordinators of care often that can help that. Well, the best practice is managing the, the right scarce resource. And I'll show you how we've developed uh, a tool to be able to do that. Quickly, um, imagine this scarcity notion. There are two students, Felix and David. Felix is busy, but he's relaxed. He turns his assignments in on time. But David, say there's a language deficit, or maybe he has a part-time job. He's crunched for time. He has the same course load, but he works more hours just to try to catch up. He's always one step behind. So this scarcity trap can also be seen in, in uh, planting and in agriculture. But we, we may be poor in terms of cash, but the key I'm trying to raise here is that we're also struggling with bandwidth issues and increased comorbid conditions where we have less access to resources. So if the major determinants of health are social, then why aren't our treatments and our remedies? Well, how important are they? If we now go from roughly 23 years of variation in Houston, Texas for life expectancy. What is it as we look globally? It's 48 years of variation. That 
impacts all illnesses and makes it more difficult to uh, achieve when you have uh, less years to be able to do it. So now looking at just the, the more westernized um, uh, economic uh, countries, the, if we look at that, we see that despite the $4 trillion spent in America, we have the, the worst um, life expectancy in that group. Well, I know I'm not talking to, um, I don't see in here Kenya, and I don't see some of the countries where people are from. So let's look at that. So here's a, a map world health chart uh, that, that shows on the, the uh, x-axis, the income, and on the y-axis, it shows lifespan, life expectancy years. So as you go up, it shows a, a higher life expectancy, but on the right side, it shows the, the cost for that. And the USA, we have the worst uh, outcomes for the greatest price. And here you can see Kenya is um, uh, in level two, and struggles with the, the annual income, but for its income, the life expectancy is far greater than one would expect. So looking at, again, I apologize, looking at some OECD countries uh, with built-in safety nets, you can see the gray is healthcare expenditure or medical expenditure, but the blue is social care. And you can see here that we spend the least of any um, OECD country and we spend the most in medical care. Well, what do we get for it? Well, we get, as you can see here, where USA is at the, the highest level at the worst, this uh, Wilkinson and Pickett look at every different measure, life expectancy, uh, illiteracy, infant mortality, homicide, social morbidity, mental illness. At every level, uh, we're, uh, we, we have the worst outcomes. And what is consistent with that? Income inequality no matter where it is in the world, the greater disparity in income, the, the worse the social and health problems. So Frederick Douglass uh, from uh, the US uh, uh, said in 1886, where justice is denied, where poverty is enforced, uh, where ignorance prevails, where one class is made to feel that society is an organized conspiracy to or oppress, rob, and degrade them. Neither persons nor property will be safe. Sadly, I think that's still true today and true all over the world. So how does this relate to data? And how does data have anything to do with these processes of care? Well, it's, I think, more about the underlying processes than the data itself. Well, what, what are the, the characteristics of data? Well, the content of the data. Who, to whom is it of interest? Patients, providers, payers, our, our insurance system, or the community? What types of data? Well, qualitative, quantitative, cross-sectional, longitudinal, uh, private health, protected health information? And what are the sources of the data? How is it integrated? The quality, is it aggregate or individual? And now what are the different types? Let's look a little deeper. And we can see that um, there's community level and agency data. It's the most accurate to identify what people's actual use of resources are or their needs. The individual level can be longitudinal and more precise than zip code data that's available in the public data sets. But it's difficult to collect and integrate. And we'll talk about one model of where we did that here. 
uh, but it can be close to real time as opposed to some of the public data sets that are several years old. And then there's government but non-public data, which is um, food stamps data, workforce data, and other types of uh, uh, governmental data. And then lastly, there's credit bureau data. And that's what I want to talk about for just a moment. We're starting to see a lot of the hospital will buy the credit data. Well, to what end? How does it serve us? Well, credit data is a kind of data colonialism to accumulate and sell by a third party. And it's used to, to judge whether or not we should let the banking system should lend someone a credit card or allow them to buy a house, give them a loan. Well, this credit data uh, that's used in medical settings is has an inherent racial bias reflecting historical biases, omitting data like rental and cell phone use. And it, it is invisible, credit invisible to people that uh, are not in the, are not uh, kind of above boards with uh, their income. And that could be not out of choice, but out of requirements. For some immigrants, they have to do all their uh, work under the table or hidden. So what's the purpose of credit scoring? It's profit, and it has no accuracy requirements. Um, black, uh, uh, indigenous, and persons of color, BIPOC consumers bear the brunt of these lawsuits related to debt collections. So how can we do better with the data we have and can use? Well, just last month, uh, now two months ago, there was an article on the typology for health equity. And I found it, this recent article restates the very processes that lead to the same health inequities that we struggle with. The process itself results in inequities. So what can we do? Well, I'd like to focus on two key pathways, the processes of care and the data processes and integration. Well, the processes of care require partnership, shared power, values-based care, and co-creation, all of which we'll be hearing more about. And data processes relate more to quality, uh, what the dashboard, how we can communicate to patients, providers, clinics, hospital systems, and populations. So first, let's look at the processes of care and understand the main theme of, in these processes, are in a way almost hidden is power and locus of control. First, we need to acknowledge the role power and locus of control plays in addressing behavior change, engagement and activation, and how that varies based on an acute care setting all the way to preventive care. So, Communication strategies um, need to be developed together rather than provided uh, in a paternalistic way. Well, I'll provide what you need to see rather than being driven from what people want to see most. So let's look a bit more at what this power uh, means. Well, it it's in the classic acute care relationship. You could be resuscitating a patient. You don't want uh, to argue about health activation and engagement because the, the doctor should be uh, empowered. But as acuity declines, the power may need to shift in order to encourage activation and engagement. Well, where do preventive and chronic care fit in this continuum? Is the level of engagement 
needed for behavior change different in acute care, like I said, you know, resuscitating someone or con cardio converting someone, would that be different than say seeing them for their annual preventive care or for, for seeing them for diabetes or high blood pressure? We can look at adherence, which is what we want in the acute care setting versus activation which is what we need in preventive and chronic care. A new dynamic and approach is needed. So let's look at what that means because this seems so nebulous. So we could have empower our pharmacists in the community to use evidence-based guidance from protocols for upper respiratory infections rather than having them cared for and clog up the emergency room at times when, say, there's a flu outbreak. We could work with community health workers, peer counselors, persons with lived experience of homelessness to expand the community behavioral health capacity and build trust and overcome barriers. This is where, to, to use your own words, the neuron to the neighborhood really is an opportunity and a real one. We could work with housing first workers to help us be informed of the need for living skills to address loneliness, depression and anxiety and how to facilitate with the changes save in homelessness from domicility uh, to back on the streets and back to domicility for people that are struggling to find kind of homeostasis in, in uh, for the first time in their life to be living indoors. We did a review, uh, colleagues from the UK and in the US on this uh, community engaged health model. I don't know if you can scan that and pull up the article, but that was the intent. Well, let's look for a moment, but quickly to talk about what a collective approach to healthcare would be by engaging communities. So first let's look at the healthcare system. And then in this healthcare system coming into their many clinics, then the interprofessional team and the community health worker uh, all in that, on that side. But then if we shift over to the ecological model and uh, begin to look at community. We can look at the organizations that serve the, the individuals in the health system at the interpersonal level and then at the consumer or client level. Well, how can we begin to shift that power to rise the sense of agency in communities that are underserved or poorly served? Well, First, we can begin to address what are some of the healthcare barriers and enablers. And then we can look at, well, what are some of the client system barriers and enablers? And just to give an example, our own paternalism, our own attachment to the expert role may limit our ability to engage communities adequately. And at the client level, uh, their willingness to engage, the dominant voices in the room that take up most of the discussion and sometimes the minority voices are not heard uh, as they should be. How can we shift that? Well, what are some principles to community engaged health? Well, again, we have to look at power, but we have to look at the assumptions of where health belongs in medicine does it belong along a continuum or is it just acute care that we're focused on? Can we look at co-creation of health? Uh, we need to move to an individual owning their own recovery, which is a chronic healthcare model and uh, a rehabilitation type model. We need to look at the resource decisions by consumers to distribute expertise and powers and licensure, like the example I just gave of a pharmacist, to be able to help the community, not just enhance the guild of, of medicine. And we need treatment for health issues that may not always be a medical intervention. 
So I want to share our approach at the University of Houston, where we worked to try to engage these communities in a different way, where there was not just a lack of trust, there was significant distrust. Our community working groups are for each uh, group in the community of which we started with only two. They're open and they, they discuss the health priorities interested to them. So we can uh, share more with you on this uh, if it's of interest in the trust, but in the, in the uh, discussion later. But I now want to get to the processes of care because it's these very processes that shape the kind of data needs that we have and can shift us more in what are patients' values, who and what is most important to them, and looking at a more holistic understanding of the challenges. We can begin to communicate these strategies through co-creation, through dashboards. How is it that we can include the consumer in the, the products of health that we design? Well, first I'd like to share with you uh, values-based as opposed to a problem-based approach and why we found it particularly helpful in disenfranchised populations. Mr. T was homeless. He had 12 emergency room visits and two hospitalizations resulting in almost a million dollars in one year. He was unemployed with HIV uh, as well as bipolar disorder. And we kept addressing his health needs, but he didn't care about his health. He cared about his dog. Now, how often do we ask who and what is most important to the patient? Well, in this case, it shifted after years of a conversation just about his health, we finally learned what mattered to him. And we focused the care so that he could take better care of his dog, resulting in him getting into primary care on his HIV and bipolar meds, where he is now employed and he has not used the ER in two years. So what does this look like? Well, we won't go into detail, but uh, this health record system is a values-focused system. Who and what is most important to Monica? What gets in her way? We need to co-create the resources based on the geocoding. Where does someone live? Well, where they may live in one encampment, but they find it better to get resources in a safer area. Well, we can do this by plugging in their address in what they want rather than what we want to give them. So now let's look at data processes and integration a little further. Well, we need innovative payment models. And that's really more in the US where despite our $4 trillion spend for pretty bad care, instead we need to shift that money into social care like in the other more successful uh, programs in, in the world. We need to democratize health data and braid it. Instead of using these silos uh, of data, we need to begin to integrate it. So we know not just say an incarceration history for someone, but their education history, their employment history, their um, what are the barriers and enablers for them? Who and what is most important to them? If we could have decision-making on that level, we uh, would offer a different product in health. And then finally, these braided data sets to reduce bias based on a more comprehensive approach. Well, let's look at what these uh, data processes and integration would look like and uh, democratize health data. Well, this is our current model where we have these silos of medical, behavioral, and social. But what we're saying, these braided data sets, this is how we begin to deal with these competing priorities, where you don't have the medical provider saying you need to pick up your meds, 
the behavior is saying you need to quit smoking or drinking and the social provider telling them they need to get an ID, they need to get a job, sending them in all different directions and no, no group working together. Well, to begin to braid that data can serve as a new model. This braided, braided data can help with these cognitive challenges. We can begin to look at this categorical data of is it a threat, is it not a threat? We need to be able to tolerate ambiguity and complexity. This categorical thinking also can distract us from compassion. Oh, well, that, that's an access to diagnosis patient. That's why they're, we're not helping them. Let's just you know, get them out of here as soon as we can. We call those gomers. Get them out of our emergency room very lacking in empathy and compassion. And it also, this categorical thinking has the fallacy of causality. A substance use disorder caused the illness or the behavior called the substance use disorder. Uh, and then we blame along those lines. We tolerate the solitary service configuration. Well, we gave you housing. Why couldn't you get your needs met for Mr. T with bipolar and HIV? Well, we're not integrating those service configurations. We could demand a new conceptualization or approach through the three Ps. A pre, we could ask and be curious about their predisposition to behavior or their problem. What are the precipitants? Why are they here now? And what are the perpetuating factors? Well, how can we look at these dashboards? Well, let's take another example, which is food and, and uh, nutritional insecurity. Well, we could braid a data set around patient values and preferences around a big centers data in Houston, one emancipation center uh, that's just come together. We could look at a food instrument or survey. We could look at nearby gardens, geocoded grocery stores to begin to understand these complex problems. And then through an algorithm, we could begin to co-create solutions with the patient. So to just give you a sense of, of this, um, we could look at the, the sub substance use disorder map on the left, which is the substance use uh, of one recovery center versus a integrated stream of data with four different themes homelessness, uh, zip code, visit dates, uh, and location, we can look at a more robust and, and a more discerning piece of data of how we might want to intervene. And I'll give another example of that, of what we did with uh, a, the jail population of seriously mentally ill. We engaged them in the jail and looking at braided data, and I'll give you an idea of what that looks like. Well, on the x-axis, we see the years of the, the dates of their visit. And on the y-axis, we look at 225, 248, 590. Those are different patients. In each of these categories, the green here, the Houston Recovery Center is for behavioral health challenges. The fire department is the emergency medical system or ambulances the jail, the police department for arrest data, and the health system, and the homeless system. If we begin to look at where these individuals seek their care, we can begin to say, hey, this individual here has interactions from the recovery center, from the fire, the EMS system, from the health system, and the homeless sector. So how can we connect a uh, intervention that works across all these agencies rather than the silos of excellence, which in an individual agency, we feel we're doing a good job, but we're not helping people. We did that for years and merely by looking at this integrated data, we looked at jail in reach differently and we met the client in the, in the uh, jail, walked them to the clinic, 
keeping them on their antipsychotic and reduced rearrest rates by 62%. So uh, now looking at community health workers, how can we work with community health workers to begin to coordinate care like we did? Those community health workers went into the jail and helped to integrate their care. Well, what do we know about the evidence of community health worker interventions? Well, what we found in a randomized controlled trial is that they're likely to, more likely to result in a higher quality primary care and reduced hospital days, resulting in decreased costs. Community health workers can navigate and address the barriers and promote behaviors where, uh, say, a physician is, is, uh, finds greater challenge. Lastly, I want to end up looking at some projects that look at community engaged health and what we've done in Houston through a democratized data set. We have 750 agencies data that are shared to the Patient Care Intervention Center with more than 3.7 million individuals showing 43 million encounters with thousands of data points. One project uh, working with the Community Information Exchange is one such example of a braided data set. And it has 170 agencies. Its focus initially is on food, mental health, and substance use disorder. And it's implemented this shared and this uh, data exchange to begin to tackle uh, broader system, multi-system level problems. It works with a population uh, in another sector, United Way, which is a major multi-billion dollar uh, social care agency that's on the private sector. And they're doing a project with ALICE, an asset limited income constrained employee, uh, less than 150% of poverty. Uh, Alice involves more than 47% of Houston area families. The systems integration with 20 partner agencies with the plans to scale to 117 agencies in a future phase, integrating data uh, from 10 different health record systems. So now looking at uh, their program is called Integrated Care Journey, where it connects the agency, often through community health workers, uh, through a client journey tool and resource map. It's about their journey, not about our journey with them. The client enters a given program. It could be related to domestic violence. They could enter the program at any point in this journey, could be through workforce coaching, but the, the end step is to engage them in services, engage them in their goals and move towards their values. So we're at the end, but beginning of our discussion. And just to overview what we talked about, we talked about social determinants of health and how our current model of addressing equity is not enough how data is integral and braided data can really help us understand the process and outcomes of care. And if we want health equity, we must look at greater inclusivity in data and in care itself. And how collective intervention and collective uh, community approaches can engage people at a collective level, which can be equally impactful. So now I'd like to shift this, get out of presentation mode. Great. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Bach. It was a very important and very illuminating uh, uh, presentation. And we have received some questions. So I will start with some questions. I think you touched upon those uh, topics, but it would be good to revisit them and maybe elaborate a little more. So, uh, Sinobar Nadim says, 
what are the effective testable ways of community engagement for healthcare? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, one way of looking at it, uh, ironically, requires that we look at outcomes in a broader vision. We can't look at community engagement and have only agency or health system or criminal justice system level data. We need to begin to, we can test it if we begin say with the jail study. We looked at the jail study where we went into uh, the community of seriously mentally ill that are incarcerated and we looked at, well, how can we join health system data with incarceration data, with jobs data, and begin to help these people collectively. And then by targeting this community level or population level intervention, we can look at outcomes that come across systems. So we look at uh, recidivism, we look at um, their readmission rate, readmission rate to the hospital or jail doesn't just involve their clinical uh, needs. It also involves, do they have housing? Because if they're not housed and they're trying to take heart failure medicine, they're going to fail. So we need to look at more collective measures, which the gold standard is mortality level data. But we need to also begin to develop algorithms that are collective, like um, a social gradient algorithm, or look at um, uh, quality of life measures. Thank you, Dave. Um, I have a question. I received a question for Maria Iqbal. Uh, thank you for this very interesting webinar. Uh, particularly in mental health, there may be interventions that, that may not be evidence-based but may be prioritized by communities. Are there strategies you have found helpful to bridge that gap? Well, that's a great question. Let me make sure I understand it. Um, you're asking if, if in addressing at the level of the community, um, do we have strategies that engages that community more effectively? And or how it not, may not be evidence-based, right? but are prioritized by, the, by communities. Well, I would say that there is a growing body of evidence from community engagement literature and um, the CVPR, Community-Based Participatory Research, uh, and uh, a model program from the Morehouse College in Georgia. But um, I think that where we can find evidence, I think we often look at this mortality data as the ultimate, the gold standard, but we really need proxy measures because in order to look at mortality data, that's years out. What are some proxy measures that we can look at. Well, we could look at, uh, uh, are people using the ERs more or less? Are they using, do they have greater access to primary care? Are they using social resources and decreasing their medical resource use? Um, so I think we can begin to look at these proxy measures, uh, which are more process measures, as we begin to refine the work we do in community. How many people are coming to the table? How many people are, um, uh, what is, uh, it's called, a, there was a book called Bowling Alone. What is, what is people's social investment? And how are people looking at community? Are they investing in each other or just their own self gain? So there are some ways of looking at social networks that can begin to approximate uh, uh, early outcome measures. Yeah, Zul, I think I see your, your hand up. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a fantastic presentation. Really enjoyed it. The, the, the commentary that I wanted to make is that, you know, in the developing countries that we are, we have our footprints in, uh, in, in East Africa and South or Central Asia, 
one of the challenges we have is that um, there is not enough capacity. In other words, we don't have psychiatrists and psychologists to the numbers uh, that would be required to provide proper care. Uh, so this is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity because I think that when you do not have those resources available, you're forced to think differently and to see how can we uh, evolve models that actually meet the needs of the people uh, through other means and how do we mobilize and empower other workers or workforce or communities or peer groups or community workers, things like that to fill the gap that exists because we, we don't have professionals giving uh, advice top down. So here's an opportunity for us, I think, to kind of grow a system um, uh, through, through minefields because even our primary care system is so disjointed in those countries that it's very hard to navigate. And I think the more we empower the communities to come up with innovative solutions that work best for them, and the more we are able to recognize and empower the communities, I think that we will come with, with very innovative models that will actually solve the problems, not only for us in the developing countries, but also for the developed countries as well, where those challenges exist. I think that's spot on because that's partly why we're, we're trying to understand, uh, despite a lack of evidence, how can community health workers, peer counselors be used to empower and meet the needs by identifying the barriers they themselves have experienced. That's easier than having a psychiatrist um, really talk about how difficult their social problems are, but do nothing about it. That's what's so frustrating is we have this split of medical doctors spending this, this resource uh, when we're spending a resource on a social problem. We're giving them a medicine, but really no way out. And I think this is where mm -hmm. our countries are have very much in common. The underserved and underclass in America has the mortality rates very similar to uh, the countries on this call, to quote, developing countries. We have income disparities that are vastly worse and have the worst health outcomes for it. So we have a lot to learn from each other. Ken Govey was a CHW researcher that has looked at uh, these disparities and has uh, developed interventions across the world. And the interventions with CHWs or peer counselors are have very similar impact in developing versus uh, we're all developing. <laughs> you know, yes. it's not a good term. Very true. So maybe we have uh, a time for one more question. And uh, we have a question from Robert Nyoroge, who actually is addressing an aspect, an important aspect that uh, that is related to what you just discussed. Uh, he said, uh, I learned some really interesting things. And his question is how to utilize data in a more holistic way to get a better understanding of factors correlated to health outcomes. So the data, how to use them in a holistic way to address all these problems. I think that's spot on because if we can integrate data in a dashboard at the client level, or at the community level, we can make sure we get that buy-in. Instead of saying, no, 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 all I care about is your blood pressure, for example, where I fail with any homeless person because it's the silent killer. If I'm trying to address health in that way, they're not gonna listen to me. But if I can identify, well, it's food I want, or the community tells you, you know, it's better jobs we want, or it's training, then we can show them the very data they want, develop interventions together, and therefore begin to move things along, not as uh, a grave hierarchy of um, the doctors and the patients, but in a, in a more team-like preventive care model. 
Thank you, Dr. Buck. I'm afraid we, we ran out of time. We have many more questions that we received, and it's obviously it's obvious to me that we will have to uh, uh, meet again and bring you again to continue this conversation. Right now, I would like to ask the audience to uh, fill in the survey uh, in the next two minutes before we close uh, this uh, webinar. So thank you and please uh, fill in the survey. Thanks very much for having me speak. I think Zul is uh, Dr. Dr. Morali will will actually close the meeting after we fill in this uh, survey. Uh, but in the meantime, I would also like to thank you for for a truly inspiring uh, presentation. And as I said, as I as I said, I think there is a plenty of opportunity for uh, the BMI and your group to uh, collaborate. Yes, I look forward to it. So thank you very much again. I wanted to. Uh, really thank David for such an outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, it's really uh, strikes to the core because, as I said, the challenges that we are facing are very much uh, how do we provide services to the people that uh, are looking to us for solutions. And, and the, 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 the answer really is very complex, but very simple at the same time. We need to engage the clients much more fully. The community members need to be the center of it. And, and as uh, Oliver just said, uh, we look forward to collaborating with you and, and understanding this systems evolution um, or revolution that we would like to call uh, to address the needs that are so glaring in the geographies that we are serving. And one of the uh, things that we are contemplating and following that I will stop is that we want to set up what we're calling living labs and in dealing with mental health issues, but in a very integrative way. So we want to look at many different aspects that feed into the mental health issues. Um, and so we want to look at things like uh, educational levels, the uh, chronicity of other health conditions and uh, um, um, their uh, capacity to interact, social networking and and climate change and many other parameters that feed into the social determinants of health. And so um, we want to kind of figure out a way of how can we uh, collect data and information much more meaningfully, not only engaging the people we, that we want to be at the focus of it, but also systems around those individuals that they are so influenced by. And we look forward to having discussions with you to kind of help us guide our uh, our interventions that we're thinking about launching in the next little while is in the development phase. But finally, I would like to say thank you uh, so very much for taking the time and giving of yourself or in knowledge and information that will really help us uh, deal with some of our own issues. And um, I also wanted to thank very much all the participants um, uh, that have attended the webinar. Um, it's so uh, without your participation, it would it would not be a success that that it was. And finally, I wanted to say thank you to Olivera uh, for moderating today's session. Thank you, uh, Olivera, great job. And I uh, wanted to thank the team that kind of helps host and put the webinar together. Thank you all, and wishing you the best. Uh, take care, and see you later. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye bye.